May every person here be quickened by your spirit to receive something profoundly personal, powerful, supernatural as we travel today in your word. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Actually, put your Bible down and stand up to your feet again. I didn't know when I was going to do this, but I knew that the Lord spoke to me that he wanted to release, listen to me now very carefully, a fresh level of grace and favor in this house. And that means you. Not just us, but you, personally. And so what I'd like us to do is I'd like to just to uh, have us do a little exercise of faith. You know, faith has some exercises. And so I'd like us to do a little exercise of faith using the verse that's on the wall behind me that says nothing... Shall be what? Impossible. For the pastor. No, it says nothing shall be impossible for you. So what I'd like you to do today is I'd like you to access that fresh level of grace right now by taking this little exercise. And I, I didn't make the, this. This came to me from the Lord. Uh, God wants us to do this. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to open your mouth. And I'd like you to put the, the word nothing, I'd like you to trade that for whatever it is that is in your life right now. So as, as, as we all pray aloud, as we all speak aloud, we're going to align ourselves with God, with his word, with heaven. And instead of saying nothing, we're going to say, my mortgage being fully paid is not impossible, Lord. My sister... Restored in a relationship is not impossible. Can you do that? And I don't want you to stop until you're finished declaring all those things that are not impossible. Okay? So God told me, he said, I'll release a fresh favor in this house on your life if you'll align yourself with heaven. So open your mouth, because that's heaven's gate. Your spirit and your mouth are heaven's gate on earth. And you say it, whatever it is. Because remember, sometimes we we hold things kind of statically. Well, it's there. But God wants you to speak to it with the word from heaven. So whatever it is, whether it's your mortgage or your debt or your body or your... Whatever it is, I don't know what it is. You know what it is. And just just carry on. You don't have to stop after you do one. You know, the story about the guy who, who hit the arrow into the ground three times and, did, and the prophet said, see, now if you'd gone further than that, we'd have totally wiped it out. So don't stop. And, unless, of course, you, you only want lesser. All right? All right, so let's open your mouth now and just... Align yourself with heaven right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you today that my family is totally in Christ. It's not impossible for my brothers to return to Christ. Not impossible, Lord, for my sisters-in-law, Lord, to come to know you as Lord. And it's not impossible to have a debt-free house. Not impossible to have total help. Not impossible, Lord, to be reconciled. Lord, with those who have wandered off. Not impossible. It's not impossible. Thank you, Lord. You said it's not impossible. You said it's not impossible that this house would move to another location. You said it's not impossible, Lord God, we'd have our own place. Thank you, Lord. You said it's not impossible that my family would be totally well. Thank you, Lord. You said it's not impossible. It's not impossible, Lord God. Oh, for there to be great expansion and enlargement and increase and fruitfulness. Thank you, Lord God. It's not impossible that revelation will come. 
in the places of ignorance and confusion. Thank you, Lord God. Nothing is impossible, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I want you to clap your hands and thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for favor today. Thank you for financial favor, for favor in health, favor in money, favor in business, favor in relationships, favor in marriage, favor in schooling, favor, Lord, with children, favor, Lord. We thank you for favor today, Lord God. You're a God of favor. Thank you, Lord God. And we declare it today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. We've been uh, examining uh, this topic about transition, crossing over, crossing into, looking at this subject of transition. You know, sometimes God's people don't realize they're in transition. They just know there's a lot of trouble going on. God's trying to get their attention by using all kinds of things uh, because he wants to take them to another place and their personal growth and their relationship or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, so the Bible's full of such plain and simple instruction about change and transition and moving from one location to another. And last Sunday we were speaking to you about uh, cultivating a Canaan mentality. I'd like you to say that this morning. I'm going to cultivate a Canaan mentality. You see, you have to cultivate a Canaan mentality. If you don't cultivate it, work at it. Plant the seeds of truth in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit. Water them, meditate in them, speak them, act upon them. If you don't cultivate that kind of mentality, the default mentality is the Egyptian mentality. That's the default. So uh, you'll have one or the other. And so the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new Christian, but he's going to struggle with Egyptian mentality the rest of his days. No, it doesn't say that. He's a new creation. So everything about your life is supposed to be different. You're supposed to think different, act different, talk different, speak different, and live in a different set of circumstances brought about by a different means. A different means. Otherwise, we're just, we got our ticket to heaven and we just live like everybody else on the planet with all the struggle and toil and turmoil and pain that goes with it. Oh, God says, I brought you out to take you in to a different way of living. So in Jeremiah chapter 29, and probably most of you, if not all of you, would know this verse. Verse 11 says, For I know the plans... I have for you. God has a plan. Let's say it. God has a plan. Lord has a plan. Say it again. God has, a plan. Lord has a plan. Now let's make it personal. God has a plan for me. Lord has a plan for say it again. God has a plan for me. Lord has a plan for me. Now, now put the emphasis where I put it. God has a plan for me. Lord has a plan for okay. If God has a plan for you and for me, it's important for us to find out what the plan is and work the plan. If the plan involves a mutual co cooperation of God and yourself, and it does, then you have to find out the plan so that you can do your part. You can cooperate with the plan. If you don't cooperate with the plan, then the plan exists. It's there. It's real. But it is, as far as you're concerned, wasted. Many people don't know that God has a plan of salvation. They don't know that God made a plan for the trouble that this planet is in. But when they came to the place where they heard God's voice knock on the door of their heart, God said, i got a plan for a different way of living for you. Give me your life. Give me your life. I'll give you my life. This is a plan that will work. And on that day, you adopted the first part of God's plan for your life. So God says, I got a plan. I'm, it's not just kind of a crazy mixed up world, and I hope you make it. I know the plans. Everybody say plans. plans. That's plural. So whatever there is in your life right now, there is a plan for it. 
there's a plan for it. You know, I have, in my journey, found myself with a lot of frustration and disappointment when I have not appealed to somebody else's plan for my circumstance. Have you ever tried really hard to do something and it didn't work out? And so you redoubled your effort and it still didn't work out again. So you tried even harder and, and it didn't work out. And then you gritted your teeth and you said, okay, I'm going to do this if it kills me. And then it did. It did. It killed you. And, and that's why you're here today because you're dead. You're here, here today because you're dead. <laughs> you, you did your best! Turn to your neighbor and say, that's what all good Egyptians do. I'm not speaking of ethnic Egyptians now. I'm talking spiritually here. Is it, that's the way of our world. If you have something that, that needs to be done or accomplished or dealt with, you apply yourself to it and you go to the gym spiritually. <laughs> Some people think, oh, God, no. <laughs> I can see that face fell there for a second when I said that, that horrible four letter word. Yeah. Some of you said, four? Just checking to see. Some of you think, yeah, four-letter word. Yeah, It's three, but it's four. Okay. I know the plans I have for you. Now, I didn't say this. Now, I, I have met people in my journey who struggle with this verse. They struggle with it. Some people struggle with the first part, that God has a plan for them. But I know the... Plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to beat you, suffer you. No, plans to, what is that word? Prosper. God has a plan to prosper. You know, that sounds like to me like a loving father. That's what it sounds like. God has a plan to prosper you. So let's kind of make it personal for a moment. Because we're going to get into, because this is all to do with the subject of, of developing a Canaan mentality. I didn't have that mentality when I came into Christ. I had the mentality that I have my ticket to heaven, but I got I to gotta kind of do everything that I, I have to do in order to, to make it through life. And so I will apply myself and, you know, I'll get educated, I'll work hard, I'll do what, you know, you're supposed to do to, to get there, so to speak. I wasn't knowledgeable of the truth that somebody else had a plan to prosper me. Because the Egyptian mentality is prosperity comes through self-effort. You are a self-prospering person. I remember speaking to a man in Texas who learned this lesson in a rather painful way. He was a lawyer. He was involved in the oil business, and he uh, became extremely wealthy. Christian man, married two children. And uh, like you, he went to church services, owned the Bible, prayed. But he said, I didn't realize that what I had amassed was sitting on a certain view of myself. What had come to me, I thought, was what I had earned in the context of my profession through my efforts. And he said, that's the mentality with which I lived. And he said, during the oil crisis in America, going back quite a few years ago, when the price of petrol rocketed up and so on, he lost everything. He had two homes, several high-value cars, boats, he lost it all, overnight. He went from being very wealthy to being $35 million in debt. 
he said, uh, we ended up living, my wife and I and our two kids, on the living room floor of some relatives. He said there were days in which I didn't have enough money to bring back home a bag of groceries. He said it was, it was really a, the most unbelievable experience to go from a position of being so comfortable to a place of such dire need. But he said, you know, as I look at it now, he said, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because it caused my wife and I to seek the Lord. And in seeking the Lord, we realized that we were living with the wrong point of view. You know, it kind of goes like this. If you made a lot of money because you got an education and so on, got into the right career and so on, and had right opportunities, you could think, like a good Egyptian, I'm fortunate, or to use another word, lucky. <laughs> and I, I did, I went to the school, I did this, I said, oh, well, tell me, where did you get the breath to breathe? Hello. Where'd you get the energy, the mentality? It all comes from him. It all comes from him. And he said, what happened to us, he said, was the best thing. And he said, you know, we, we cried out to the Lord and we repented for believing that we had amassed all of this by our own ability. We had achieved this through effort and work. And you know, if, if that's the way you see it, then that's the way it is for you. Ultimately, everything we have comes from him. God said, when you came to Christ, he said, I want you to learn a different way. You can work in this world but the blessing that is to come to you is to come to you not because you are earning it, but because I bless you with it. And he said, well, anyway, we cried out to the Lord and we, we, we repented of our own self-sufficiency and self-dependence. And he said, I didn't even realize how much pride I had just because of kind of what a the sequence of how I'd gotten there. But he said, I want to tell you today, he said, our whole family, everything has changed. I'm back in employment. I have a job in another law firm. He said, I have $5 million in the bank. And he said, there are lots of people who are coming to know Jesus across the globe because we are sowing like crazy into God's mission and God's purpose. And he said, our lives have totally changed. And we know that every penny that's in our account got there because God said, I took you down to zero so I could show you what grace looks like. I could show you what favor looks like. I, I, I wanted you to see, you know, that what you get by your own. As the Bible says, and go just like that. But when it comes from me, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and adds no sorrow. So it's, it's developing a Canaan mentality. And so he says, I have a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I believe that that's where we must learn to live, is that God's plan is to prosper me. And you would say, but wait, 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 wait a minute, Pastor. But doesn't the Bible also say, in the world you shall suffer tribulation? It certainly does. It certainly does. 
But how many of you would rather suffer tribulation with more than with less? All right, and the rest of you, you're just going to be content to be totally miserable. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, when God blesses you, you, you know, you exit this place. No, God, God blesses you so you, you can accomplish working with him things that he has on his heart and stand up to all the trouble that comes, as we'll see. And I believe the whole story of Israel is, is such a, a powerful lesson here. Turn with me to Psalm 112. Psalm 112. In terms of cultivating a Canaan mentality, you know, God said 21 times in the Bible uh, the word milk and honey is, is mentioned in relation to Canaan. 21 times. And if you look at Joshua chapter 1, uh, I think it's a, something like 10 times God says, I gave it to you, I give it to you, I'm, I'm giving it to you. Yeah, you give, give, yeah, that's, it's yours, it's, it's your possession. And, and so God says, I want, you to, I want you to know that your inheritance is a place characterized by this phrase, milk and honey. One uh, scholar says, uh, milk and honey in this context means pure enjoyment. Pure enjoyment. Now you can have an enjoyment that's not pure. But God says, I'm going to take you to a place where you can have pure enjoyment. I know... Uh, I had so been indoctrinated with the notions that to have some was wrong, that if I, if I bought something new, I felt guilty. I actually, I actually did. I felt guilty. Now, if, if you ask me, Pastor, were, were you thinking that if you, if you got that, you were committing a sin? Well, I'm not sure that my thought processes had gotten that far, but I felt guilty. I felt that I had done something wrong. He said, now, Pastor, that is crazy. I don't mind wearing new shoes. <laughs> no, how many of you don't mind wearing new shoes? It's just breaking them in that's the problem. <laughs> but that's kind of where I was in, in my upbringing. It's, it's, and, and, and that's perverted. That's perverted, as, as you'll see. And so there had to come some major shift not only in relation to myself, but other people. Other people who, who were blessed. I had to ha adopt a whole different mentality to other people who were blessed. I had to connect with some people who were incredibly blessed and not have the finger of suspicion and judgment that pointed at them and say, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know how you got that. That kind of lying accusation only comes from one source. But I like Psalm, 120, Psalm 112, and I believe this is the bank of heaven. If you want a, a chapter in the Bible that you could call the bank of heaven, it's Psalm 112. And I'd suggest you take it and use it and memorize it and meditate in it. And every time you get in trouble, go back to Psalm 112. And there'll be something in there that God will say, yeah, yeah, that belongs to you. That's part of your inheritance. Yeah, I gave that to you as well, and that to you as well, and that to you as well. He says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. And that's really what happened with Israel. They didn't find great delight in his commands initially, but after a few kicks in the backside, God got them out of Egypt. And, uh, you know, they're in and out there in the wilderness. But they didn't delight in God's commands. And, in fact, they kind of... Uh, slandered God by saying to Moses, why'd you bring us out here anyway? But the second generation, they said, ah, yes, we're well able. Whatever God says, we're going to go for it. They delighted in God's commands, and they walked in the fear of the Lord. Now let's go to verse 2. I like this, and, and all the years of my children were growing up. I lived a lot in this verse. His children will struggle through school if they get into the right one. Is that what your version says? No, it doesn't say that. You know, and I, I know uh, 
Sometimes, you know, you can get a, a spirit of fear that comes on you if you're a parent. And you think, well, you know, I don't, you know, I have children. They're small. They, they're growing up in a really terrible, wicked world. I don't know. Uh, no, no. This is what anchors your soul, your spirit, and produces. His children will be what? <laughs> now, that's big, isn't it? It's not going to be ordinary. He doesn't say ordinary, get by, slide by. No, he says his children will be mighty in the land. In other words, they're going to they're have a place of great strength and great influence. God says, I have my plan for you. It doesn't just cover you. It covers your offspring. And, you know, you can sit here today and say, yes, but, Pastor, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, you can listen to any time you hear the word of God, you can hear the yes but going off in your head. You ever, ever met the yes, but? <laughs> yes, but my son is doing this, and my daughter is doing that, and uh, go back to the bank of heaven. Say, Father, you said it. I'm claiming my inheritance. And every day across this globe, there are boys and girls that are not so young anymore that are coming back to Christ and coming back to their families. Because God said, my plan for them that they be mighty and there was a mother and a father who were praying and believing and, a, and asserting and declaring and claiming this favor for their kids it's a different mentality I've watched the tears stream down the face of parents who thought that their daughter or their son had no hope and no future because of the course they'd taken if you're going to have a yes but going on in your head and come out your mouth, it should be, wait a minute, that's not the final story. That's not the last word. This is the last word as far as my children are concerned. His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be struggling. Then, then we get to verse 3. You may not like verse 3, but this is a Canaan mentality verse. And, I, and that's, that's, why the, that's why it's so important to read and meditate the Bible and, and to say the Bible. You know, in your own devotional life, just, just say it aloud. Say it. Just say it. Because... What God's thoughts are are so big and so wide and so deep and they're, they're so full of spirit and life that when you embrace them internally and you meditate them and you talk them and you pray them and you declare them, something begins to happen to you. What begins to happen to you is you take those faith exercises as you begin to get around the reality of those things, the reality that's hidden in those promises and they become your reality. Otherwise, it could just be a page in your Bible. Oh, yeah, that's a good verse. Yeah, that's a good verse. Yeah. You can have a relationship with the author through his word. I want to encourage you to do that. If you're going to develop a Canaan mentality, you can say wealth and riches are in my house. I'd like you to do that today. I'd like you to cultivate a Canaan mentality by saying wealth and riches are in my house. Now, some of you have a pained look on your face. Pastor, I don't even have a job. I'm retired. I have a fixed income. Whose word do you live by? Egypt's word? Your history's word? God's word. Wealth and riches. Someday when I get to heaven and can scrape something off the streets of gold, no, wealth and riches are in my house. Say it again. Wealth and riches are in my house. Some of you are, are struggling with this. Come on now. Be honest. You're, you're struggling with this. This, is, this hasn't been my history, Pastor. And, you know, I'm not so curious, you know, comfortable with, I mean, wealth and riches. I mean, who wants to be, you know, have wealth and riches, you know, because look at the people who have wealth and riches today. And well, let's keep reading. 
What's the next phrase say? Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. righteousness. And his righteousness endures. You know, I can chart in my own journey the place where I thought wealth and riches was wrong. Then I thought, okay, yeah, God wants me to prosper. But then I moved to the next place, which was, yeah, but I, I'm not so sure I really want to go there because, you know, I know that people I've known, you know, money has sucked them away from the kingdom of God. And so before I can move to the next level, I had to deal with something going on in here, in my head, the spirit of fear. Hello. You know, the spirit of fear does crazy things to your head. It does. And if you don't realize the spirit of fear, then it will do crazy things to your head and your life, and you'll just live there. I, I think I told you this story. I was in, in Wales. We were having a meeting. Lots of people were being healed. Came up to a fellow, and I said, so uh, what would you like? Uh, he said, well, he said, I, I, I really don't want prayer. I said, you don't want prayer? He said, yeah, I have a disability. I said, you have a disability, but you don't want prayer. He said, yeah. He said, I, I'm afraid that if I got healed, then I'd have to go back to work. I'd lose my disability. <laughs> you know? Think, okay. I mean, we need a little lobotomy here, spiritual one, you know, a little brain transplant here. If, if I get healed, I will lose my disability, and then I'll have to go back to work. <coughs> Satan will use any kind of fear, no matter how stupid or even reasonable it seems, to keep you from going to the next level and adopting your Canaan mentality. Somehow, if you got wealthy, you would, you would just be get so proud they couldn't make a hat big enough for your head. And, and you just walk away from God. And, you know, you got to deal with that. You got to deal with it. And I'm going to tell you how to deal with it in a very practical way. So he says, wealth and riches in his house, his righteousness endures forever. Verse 4, even in darkness, everybody say darkness. darkness. Light dawns. So if you're in darkness this morning in some area of your life, some area of you're ignorant, you're not understanding, you don't know the way forward, the Bible says even in darkness, light dawns. Everybody say light dawns. Light is dawning for me. Light is dawning for me. What house I'm supposed to buy, that's, that's dawning for me. The car I'm supposed to have, that's dawning for me. How to get out of debt, that's dawning for me. The light dawns. Who's the light? God's the light. He said, I got the key to that. I got the key to that. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. For the gracious and compassionate and righteous man. Verse 5, good will come. Everybody say, good will come. Say it again. Good will come. Now let's, let's make it personal. Good will come to me. Come on, say it. Good will come to me. No, you didn't say it like I said it. Good will come to me. Now good will come to me. So good can come to you. See, this is... I, know, I, I listened to a woman at, at a checkout telling the pharmacist that she only had five more years to live. And the, another woman standing there said, what? so what are you suffering from? She said, uh, nothing. But she said, my mother died when she was five years from now, so I, I will die then. <coughs> now that's the opposite of good will come to me. That's death will come to me. <laughs> death therapy. No, good will come to me. Good will come to me. 
Now, notice the, the way it's phrased. It doesn't say, I'm going to go after good. Hello. That's Egypt. Good will come to me. So I'd like you to speak to good. I'd like you to speak to good. Say good. Come. come. Say good. good. Come. come. Good. good. Come. 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 Come to me. Come to me. This, week. this week. Good. good. Come, to me. come to me. Thank you, good. Thank you, good. I know you heard me. Good. You're on your way. On your way. I welcome you. You felt better for saying that, didn't you? I could tell some of your face changed, you know? Oh. You know, the best therapy is in the Bible. It is. Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Verse 6, he, surely he will never, never be shaken. Never be shaken. You know, you can have shaking circumstances. I don't think probably there's probably nobody here who hasn't had some of those at one level or another. What shakes you may not shake somebody next to you. But if you live in this life, it's constantly rock and roll. There is a drama that's coming if you haven't had one already. Hello. But it isn't the drama that's coming that makes the difference about your future. It's how you handle it. God says, I, my plan for you, so that when the wind blows and the hurricane comes and this fire comes and all, that, all kinds of crazy stuff that happens, it won't shake you. It won't shake you. It won't shake you. You know, sometimes you just have to get honest with the Bible. Say, well, you know, this, this is what it says. This, this may not be my history, but this is where I'm going to live the mentality I'm going to have, never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. Verse 7. Wow, this is, this is a really good one. He will have no fear of Brexit. No. He... <laughs> he will have no fear of bad news. He will have no fear of bad news. Everybody say, no fear. No fear. Now wealth and riches, your kids doing well, you know, and no fear and not being shaken. This, this sounds like pure enjoyment of life. And we're only looking at one chapter. This is a Canaan mentality. No fear of bad news. We live in a bad news world. You turn on your TV and it's, there's no good news on the news. And most of the news isn't news anyway. It's all speculation, theory, and accusation. You know, very, very little news in it. Theresa May, she's under terrible pressure, like she was yesterday and tomorrow. So, you know, it's, it's all secular prophets today always have lots of bad news. He'll have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. I like this verse 8. His heart is secure. Secure, safe. He will have, once again, no fear. Everybody say, no fear. No fear. In the end, he will struggle through and make it to heaven on a banana peel. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> Come on now, let's, let's, let's. In the end, he will look in triumph. I like it. So put that on something you're facing right now. Just say, okay, I'm putting, I'm putting the word on you today. I'm putting the word triumph on you. That's my inheritance. That's my portion. That's what the word of the Lord is. That's the new favor I've got. That's the good that's coming. I'm putting triumph on you. That's the label I'm putting on you. You've been in my head something else, but I'm putting triumph on you. That's the new label I'm putting on you. 
In the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. He scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures once again forever. His horn will be lifted high. Everybody in the world is trying to get their horn lifted up. In other words, exaltation. We live in a selfie world. You know, and this whole thing of self-promotion. You know, God wants you to be promoted. And he'll promote you with purpose. With purpose. And that'll be healthy. And that'll be influential for a good cause. The wicked will see it and be vexed. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Well, move over with me in your notes to page 7. Last week, one of the principles that we highlighted as we looked at developing a Canaan mentality is that it's okay for me to be blessed. So I want you to say that again today because I, I want us to all develop this Canaan mentality. Say, it's okay, it's okay. For, me blessed. for me to be blessed. Now let's move it up a level. It's okay, it's okay. For, me blessed. for me to be greatly blessed. Now some of you know what blessing is. God wants to take you, whatever level that is, to another level of blessing. You know, you say, but Pastor, John 1, I think it's verse 14 says, for we all have received one blessing after another. So your God's got, God's got all his blessings stored up in what I call the warehouse of grace. And he says, he's, you know, it's just billions and billions and billions of tons of grace and favor and increase and promotion and, and health and strength and purpose and fruitfulness. I, I just got it all here. And he says, I, I have planted it just so that it just rolls onto your life. One blessing after another, after another, after another, after another. One blessing after another. It's okay for me to be greatly blessed. All right, looking at your, your uh, little graph there on kind of the life that you used to have. Egypt was survival. Canaan is abundance. We saw that, John 10, 10. I came, Jesus came that you might have life and that you could squeak by. No, no. You came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Have it to the full. Abundant life. Abundant life. Not enough. Generous. We saw that and we looked at that last week. We went to that very big controverted verse in the Bible where God says, I will make you rich so that you can abound in good works. Now, if you don't want that, fine. Start going, I mean, carry on. What could you do if you had more money? Some people, I've heard people say to me, you know, Pastor, I don't, I don't want any more money. One man said to me, I don't, want, I don't want a church bigger than 100. I don't want any more money. I got enough money. Whatever is going on, I'm, 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 I'm at enough. That's a deception. That's a deception. So, Pastor, how can you say that's a deception? It's simple. God didn't design your life so you could live it for you and just get comfortable yourself. He designed you to reveal Him as a God whose heart never stops giving. Never stops giving. And once you decided, I'm comfortable. I'm just comfortable. I don't need any more. I don't want any more. I don't want any more responsibility. That's a deception. God says, I've got a plan for you. And my plan is to bless you. And then when your head can't take it, to bless you some more. And when your head can't take it, to bless you some more. And when your head can't, to bless you some more. So that it comes out of your pocket and travel somewhere else. And may not just be this. And so it's all this is part of a Canaan mentality. And you think about it, if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to get the go on the YouTube and listen to the message. I started the message with a story about uh, slavery, real slavery in modern times. 
And now God took a, three families out of slavery, I mean real slavery, and brought them into a, another whole world. And that's really just kind of a modern parallel of what God has done with us spiritually. He says, I took you out of Egypt and I brought you into another land, a land that's called Canaan, that is so radically different and you have to live differently. You have to have a different view, a different mentality, different attitude, different perspective, different values than the land that you came from. So God is saying to us all, I want you to adopt a mentality for the location that you are now in. Stop living like you were in Egypt and start living more like you're in Canaan. Live with the Canaan mentality. In Egypt, as you know the story, they did everything with toil, blood, sweat, and tears. But God says, I'm going to give you rest with your labor. You'll, you'll need to work, but you'll have rest. You can enjoy your work. In Egypt, they had oppression. God says, I'll promote you. We looked at those verses. Egypt was works. Everything you got, you got through your own hard work. If you were making brick, you had to make a brick for your slave driver. And if you got any money for it, then that's the money you had to do with whatever. And that's all you had. And that's the way our Egyptian system is built today. What you have is what you got. And if you don't get much, that's, sorry, that's just tough luck. You didn't get educated. You didn't have the right opportunity. You didn't choose the right career. You didn't have the right skill set. Your, your face didn't fit when you went to, you know, and somebody didn't like you or your relative or whatever. So, you know, you just, you just you, your future was just messed up from the beginning. Sorry, that's, that's, that's life. That's life. Well, that's life in Egypt. Not life in Canaan. The grace. God says, I'm going to give you cities you didn't build, houses you didn't build. I was reading a story about a man who's given away six homes. And they, were, they weren't kind of fixer-uppers either. <laughs> These were large, very elaborately put together homes and he gave them away just gave them to people and that's after he and his wife had gone and you know did everything that they possibly could think of to make it a really comfortable nice place and then they did that and God said okay I'd like to, you to give that to someone oh okay and how many know that's a different mentality that's a different mentality and that's my house I'm paying the mortgage on it's mine. Oh, they, they didn't have any mortgages on the houses that they gave away. And so they gave them to people who had no home. Now I want you to think about it for a second. You don't have a home. Maybe you're renting, barely getting by, maybe a one bedroom, shared flat, whatever. And somebody rings you up and says, you know, I was praying for you the other day, and God said, give you my home. So come by the house, and we'll go down to, you know, solicitors and get the deed changed so it can be in your name. Now, you've got a serious problem. You have to change the address that you have on your phone. That's a problem. How many know that's a problem? And you're not, you don't have, the other problem is, what about the place where you're at? It's going to be a pain leaving there. And now you're going to go into this house and it is, whoo, it's nice. And so you're, you're living there, but you didn't buy it. You didn't get a mortgage for it. God gave it to you. So what are you going to do with that? What you do is 
you get the big shrubs and you put it all around the house, let them grow up really high so no one can see how you are blessed. Because you don't want other people to think that you're one of those. No, no. You, you're a walking testimony. You're a walking testimony. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I believe that the cross of Christ covers the whole scope of the human condition. Everything from your finances to your education to your employment, your, your relationship, your family, your ministry, your call, everything is covered in the cross of Christ. So if Jesus said, I scrubbed your record clean, I made you whiter than snow so that you could have an eternal relationship with me, would he stop there and just say, okay, yeah, you got your ticket now. Maybe somebody should come along and shoot you so you get to heaven. <laughs> no, he said, in the warehouse, I've got everything else for your life because I am the way, the truth, and the life. I like you to have the life I paid the price. To give. After all, you pray it when you pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done at Raymond's house. No, no. On earth as it is. So what's there should be here. Hello? Grace, I'll give you houses. I'll give you fields, vineyards. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the poverty of God's provision. No, no, it says God was not skint. It says, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Uh, the riches, of the, God, you put those two words together, riches and grace together. Riches of God's grace. That he lavished on everybody else but me. No, he says, he lavished on us. With all wisdom and under... God knew what he was doing. God says, I'm going to bless you with grace. And not just grace, the riches of my... The abundance, the pluthios, this, this super abundant favor. I'm going to put that on you. Oh, yes, but God, I, I'll be happy, you know, if I make 300 quid a week. If I, if I don't get any life debilitating illnesses if my wife loves me most of the time. I'll, I'll be happy. God says, no, no. I want to lavish on you. Moving forward in your notes there, Egypt is characterized by worry, fear, and anger. You know if you work in this world, that's, that's, the, that's the diet that's there all the time, worry, fear, and anger. That's, and in fact, sometimes it's not even below the surface. Worry, fear, and anger. You don't have to go very far when worry, fear, and anger are going to come out. But what is, what is Canaan? Romans 14, verse 17, God says, The land I put you in is righteousness, peace, and joy. You know, practice giving away Canaan when you go to work tomorrow. Walk up to one of your work colleagues and said, oh, you know, I've got, I got a, a special delivery from Canaan for you. <laughs> They'll probably look like, what? <laughs> Does DPD deliver there? <laughs> <laughs> you know what my delivery is? I got joy. Well, what, 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 are you, what are you talking about joy? Well, I got joy just, just because, of, you know, I, I've been discovering where, I, where I'm living. Well, you know, my inheritance, you know, I've got, I got this word from my father about inheritance, and, and I'm just so full of joy. Your, your dad, he died? 
No, he didn't die. The nice thing about it is I got my inheritance and he's still alive. His son died, but I, I still got the inheritance. What? They won't get it. They have no such resource at all. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Developing a Canaan mentality. Pursuing material things. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. And I'm about to close here. Yes, Pastor, we've heard this prophecy before. <laughs> Matthew 6, verse 31 says, Do not worry. Turn to your neighbor and say, Do not worry. Do not worry. Say, worry is illegal. Say it again. Worry is illegal. Worry. Say you're not, allowed. you're not allowed. You're not allowed. You're not allowed. Now some of you are been, you know, could be arrested seriously. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not saying making this. That's a command. God says, do not worry. So if you don't worry, what do you do with what's going on in your head? I believe. You see, worry is a form of belief. It's believing the, the negative. Trust is believing the promises. So do not worry. Do not worry. Yes, but I could lose my job. I might not get another contract. You know, this pain in my knee, it could be cancer. You know, do not worry! It's illegal. What shall we eat? Now, so I realize sometimes that's more a matter of choice than not knowing that we're going to have something to eat. What shall we eat? And, you know, all these are really popular issues right now. What shall we eat? What? What? The other day they said there's some group now in, in the UK, maybe you saw this, they want, their, they want to make milkshakes illegal. Because it's causing Brexit or global warming or something. <laughs> Make milkshakes illegal. I don't know. What shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? Now notice the next phrase. For the pagans. Who are the pagans? Egyptians. People who are not sons, people who are not in the kingdom of God, not part of God's covenant family. He says, the pagans run after, run after all these things. That's what you're taught. Go to school, get the best grades you can, get the best qualification you can, get the best job you can, and get out there and make it. Run, 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 run. Then when you're 53... Oh yeah, well I'm, I'm you know I've just about secured my entire my my entire uh, re retirement, and when I get my retirement, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but uh, I'll certainly be resting from all this running. Hello. Some of you aren't even 53 yet. <coughs> Pagans run after all these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So, that's Egypt. Let's, next page, fear abiding as opposed to continual safety and security. And, and we'll, we'll kind of pause there. I'd like you to, Janelle, put up uh, what Egypt looks like. Uh, the mold, yeah. Of many people, this is a symbol of their life on earth. And, you know, it kind of reminded me when Dean and I were in house arrest in Pakistan, uh, we couldn't go out under the threat of being killed, and so they had to bring us our food. And so they brought us our food, and I remember Fala came, and he said on the first day, he says, okay, I need to tell you how to eat those japatis. <laughs> well, Dean and I had eaten a lot of japatis before. 
But he said, you know, we, we buy these uh, from these roadside vendors that have a little cart by the side of the road and all the trucks go by and all their brake dust comes off and goes into the batter. And so when they make the japatis, it's got all these little black spots in there. So you've got to pull out the little black spot so, that, you know, so you don't eat that because it's kind of gritty and doesn't taste very good. And, and then, you know, fold it in and, and eat, eat your japati with your curry. What are, I didn't have to ask him what was in the curry. <laughs> But he said, this, this is, <laughs> but you know, Dean and I are, Dean's big fellow. We, we were hungry, you know. And uh, so that's how we, we learned to eat our japatis, uh, was to pick out the black spots. And I thought, you know, really often this is a symbol of life in Egypt, is that if you look at that bread, uh, there is some bread that's edible there. So I, downstairs, down, downstairs, I've got two guys. That I, it took me a long time to get the bread in this condition so each of you could have a slice before you went home. Uh, just to kind of remind you what you, you got saved you out of. Because this, you know, that's, you know, you, you were trying to, you know, dig amongst the. Would you, uh, would, you, would you have the stewards bring in that moldy bread, please? <laughs> In the boxes down by the entryway. No, Chris, Chris, Chris. <laughs> you think I'm teasing, don't you? If I am, I'm teasing for a purpose. God wants to change that diet to what's under this tablecloth. I know you came in here and said, what? are we having communion today? God wants to change what's under that, change that diet or what's under this tablecloth. And so I like uh, Tina DG and and Andrea, would you help me? Just come, come if you would. You can stand on the back side of the table here. I wanted you to take something with you today that is a symbolic picture of a Canaan mentality. What you see on the screen right now is the Egypt mentality. But I'd like you to stand to your feet right now. But I'd like you to remember as, as you walk through these days and we finish this year and we go to next year. That's not my inheritance. Come on now, that's not my inheritance. Is that your inheritance? No. What is your inheritance is symbolized more in what's under this tablecloth. Would you like it? You're saying, we pastor, we trust you. <laughs> and I tell you, you know, Canaan was a land, one Bible scholar says, it was a delightsome land. It was a land filled with delight. There was milk and honey. It was a place of sweetness. And that's, that's what's under this tablecloth. So I'd like you to, Form a line down this aisle here and come to get some Canaan. See, this is your, your walk of faith. You say, but Pastor, we, we don't even know what's under that tablecloth. Why do you think this series of messages? You've got to spy out the land. 
And when you spy out the land and you see what's, what's there, you say, yeah, I'll have that. Now, there's only one caveat to this. You can't start with this before you get out of this building. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll clean a lot of it off the floor. <laughs> so I want to pray right now. Close your eyes right now. You know, we say like David in the Psalms, Lord, how sweet is your love. How much we delight in your love and your loving kindness. We didn't deserve it. But you said, I, I just want to love you. And bring the sweetness of my grace and my presence into your life again and again and again. Again and again and again and again. Thank you, Lord. You love us so much. Lord, as we step forward to take this little symbolic picture of the new life that you have provided for us, may we be reminded continually of the constancy and the faithfulness of your sweetness and of your love for us. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, you may come and.